The revolution's begun The time to stand up has come We are the rocking of the throne We are the rocking of the throne Victor Tiffany with Revolt Against Plutocracy interviewing today Jerome Siegel, the candidate for president in the Bread and Roses Party. Jerome, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, thanks. So let's begin with your motivation. What, what, uh, why are you running for president uh, on a third party ticket? Let's begin there. Okay. Um, well, it's not about votes. Uh, we've got no illusion about um, getting very large numbers of votes and we've got no um, uh, belief in the viability of um, somehow uh, constructing a national third party that over the years is going to uh, expand and exercise genuine power uh, in the United States. Uh, ours is really um, um, an educational effort. We're really concerned with uh, putting out um, ideas that aren't uh, part of the discourse, both in terms of value perspectives on the nature of our country, the problems we face, and also developing new policy ideas that, um, uh, that haven't been articulated uh, thus far. And so um, uh, in some way, um, you might say we're a lot like many nonprofits that, um, that have a set of ideas that they're trying to do educational work around. And the conclusion that we came to is that the electoral process is really the primary free speech arena in the United States. So the point at which people are actually listening and you can get some attention to what you're saying and people will listen and reflect on it um, is actually within the context of electoral politics. So, so that's really what we're about. Just to uh, make a point on that uh, claim, you don't think Black Lives Matter is being heard or any of their messages are being understood and heard? By uh, let's, just a second, something happened to the, um, to the camera here. You're looking okay on my end. Um, I've got some crazy. Yeah, no, of course I do. Um, no, I wasn't saying that electoral politics is the only way uh, that you can get heard and depending on on who you are and what your message is and whether or not it's a movement there may be all sorts of opportunities uh, what I'm saying is that um, if you think of it from the point of view of let's say uh, a small nonprofit I'll give you an example um, there's um, there was a group called uh, new American dream which has a perspective that in many ways is very similar to Bread and Roses about um, uh, the necessity for redefining what we think of as the American dream in the United States. Something about perspective about cultural change and a new way of thinking about the, the purpose of the economy. Uh, I was part of a, a group a number of years ago that was called the Simplicity Forum. And it was a set of 20 or 30 people like myself who had written books about simple living. So we were people who were engaged in sort of challenging uh, many fundamentals, not just about the economy, but about our culture, about the way we think about life, about the way we think about work and money and so on. Um, and then the question is, how um, do you actually um, build that into something bigger? And uh, I moved in, in, in first in the direction of what I call the politics of simplicity. So I wrote a book um, that was called Graceful Simplicity, The Philosophy and Politics of Simple Living. And that was, a, on, from one perspective, it was, this was a, you know, around the year 2000. From one perspective, it was adding one more book on simple living to probably uh, 50 or 100 that had been written in the, in the previous 10 years, because it was an issue that was a good deal of attention. And I had some things to say about about simple living per se. But what was unique about my book is that I talked about the politics of simple living. And what I was urging is that we think about 
the kind of changes that we're interested in, not as self-help issues, but as issues of public policy and creating an environment that is um, user-friendly, let's say to people who wanted to live uh, much more simple lives. So I advocated what I call the politics of simplicity. So, and in that book, part of what I started to develop is a public policy agenda for making uh, the choice of, of simple living something that was much more feasible for the average person rather than requiring sort of, you know, full scale counterculture movement. Um, going one step further than just beginning to identify public policy dimension of this was actually to put it in the context of a specific campaign. And so I ran actually in the Democratic Party challenging Senator Ben Cardin in the Maryland primary in 2018. And part of that, the, the primary motivation for that actually had to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has really been the primary area of my activism for almost four decades now. But secondarily, uh, what I ran on was what I called uh, a bread and roses platform. And the roses part of that was very much akin to this politics of simplicity that I was talking about. So we developed um, a public policy agenda that was part of the campaign. And now, uh, in the, after that primary, uh, for a variety of reasons, I ended up resigning from the Democratic Party and starting Bread and Roses. But the agenda of Bread and Roses really was a carryover of the, the challenge that I had to Cardin, where it's in many ways, I mean, the bread part of our, of our platform, if, I, if you want me to go on on this. Actually, I, the, the, the fact that you ran as a Democrat serves as a segue I want to my next question that I wanted to ask. All right, go on with your question. We can come back to the platform. Yeah, you're very careful about uh, not wanting to get right in votes or, or take votes away from Joe Biden in swing states. So it's clear you're not running to, to win and you're making very certain that your candidacy does not harm uh, Joe Biden's candidacy. I, I'm not sure why, because from our view, Biden's more dangerous than Donald Trump's. So I don't know what you're worried about interfering with as a third party candidate. You don't hear that kind of uh, concerns coming, for example, from the Green Party or the Libertarian That's Party. Right. That's so right. why don't you just come out and, and advocate for Joe Biden. Well, well actually, this kind we, of a performance art on your part. Well, what we do say actually is that uh, in the in the swing states, uh, we do urge people to vote for Biden. Um, what we're saying is that in the states that are clearly red or clearly or, or, or clearly blue, um, uh, you can vote against Trump and also vote your values. So if, if Joe Biden um, isn't someone that excites you, but Bernie Sanders was, uh, there's a way of uh, voting for uh, a Sanders-like or a Warren-like candidate that has, in addition, interesting things to say that weren't part of the Sanders or, or, or Warren campaign. Uh, and you shouldn't throw your vote away by, by just adding one more uh, anti-Trump vote to Biden's total. So um, our perspective is that um, there's, voting is, is, is a complex act and there are many reasons to do it, but you make no contribution to determining who's, who's going to be president if in a very safe state, uh, you just add one more vote to, um, to Biden's total. Let's so about policy that's our perspective. Second. The fundamental, if I could say one thing, sure. the fundamental um, judgment that we apparently disagree with you about, and and I guess the Green Party, um, is the um, is the relationship in the potential consequences of a of a Trump victory versus a Biden one, and you know we tend to view it as a no brainer that. Um, that, 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 that Trump, it's not because of any incredible um, esteem for Joe Biden, but it's, it, it's because I think of a, of, of a much more negative perspective uh, on Trump, where we view him as, as a unique danger to, um, uh, to our society of the sort that we haven't 
I, I certainly haven't seen in my lifetime. So for me, um, uh, I would say if you could, if you asked me to, you know, to point to one thing that I want to see happen in November that I would think is the most important, it, it's Trump losing. So if you don't agree on that, or if we disagree on it, which we obviously do, uh, then, then of course, the whole question of what to do in swing states, uh, you come out in a very different place. Yeah, you want to basically not allow, and, and this is true for basically anybody who says, no, no, you won't vote blue no matter who. People in swing states just can't vote their conscience. They have to hold their nose and vote for someone they believe to be the more dangerous of two candidates. You think that's Trump, but it's not, Trump isn't responsible for uh, the cops killing black Americans. They've been doing this for decades and decades. Trump isn't responsible for outsourcing American jobs. That's what the neoliberal Democrats have been doing for decades and decades. As we say quite often, neoliberalism is the disease, Trump is a symptom. So basically what you're suggesting for those in swing states is the, it, it, the body politic is suffering from alcohol poisoning. So let's give us some vodka. That'll, that'll solve the problem. Well, okay, that's, that, that's, that, that, that's your characterization in what's a very, a, a very big issue. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it's not one that I share. I'm just wondering if really the most fruitful thing is for us to debate Donald Trump here, or maybe, maybe we should talk about, um, about bread and roses and my candidacy might be more useful. I would like to talk the about one about Trump policy that you already is brought up. Is the, Israel, I want to talk about the one thing you brought up, which is the Israeli uh, uh, Palestinian conflict. Sure. I had an organizer of Students for Democratic Society. He actually was one of the founding members of that. Who was that? Because I was involved with that too. Uh, Norman. He, he, he went to Rutgers. Norman, I can't think of his last name. But he, he won't support Biden because of his position on, on Israel. He, don't think, he doesn't think he's any better than, than yeah. uh, Trump on, on this issue. Well, he's, I, I'm, I'm very critical of, of, of Biden on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue also. Um, but he's not, he, he isn't um, uh, as, as bad as Trump by a long shot. I mean, Trump is unique. I mean, we've had, we've had um, you know, Republican presidents and Democratic presidents, and, and there hasn't been that much difference between them. And in fact, on the Israeli-Palestinian thing, um, you know, uh, George W.H. Bush uh, is, was probably the best president that we've had in the last several decades, uh, because he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with right-wing Israeli Prime Minister Shamir uh, over uh, pro over the settlement issue and providing lo American uh, loan guarantees. And he played a major role, actually, I think, in, in Shamir being defeated. Uh, and then he himself was, was defeated for, for re-election also. But uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian thing, I mean, Trump has done things that no American president has done. One example is, is just that um, he just decided to, um, uh, to move the American embassy uh, to Jerusalem and to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Well, every American president prior to him, in fact, every American president going all the way back to 1948 has not recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Uh, and, and Trump did this and then boasted that he had uh, taken Jerusalem uh, off of the negotiating table, which of course was, was absurd, but it was, it was the most astonishingly lopsided uh, piece of American policy that we've that we've ever seen, and Jerusalem was identified uh, in the Oslo Accords as one of the major issues that would be resolved through direct negotiations between Israel and the PLO. So Trump was, you know, completely, you know, contrary to that. And the current thing that's very much on the table now uh, is whether or not Israel would unilaterally annex uh, some significant chunk of the West Bank. Um, and that's a direct violation of what Israel agreed to uh, when, it, when it signed the Oslo Accords with the PLO. And every American president has been against that. And Biden has come out and said that he's against it. But at the same time, Biden is weak on this issue. He hasn't said, for instance, we urged um, that either he, he revoke 
the U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, or he balanced it by recognizing a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. Uh, Biden is not going to do that, but that's our position. But what Biden has done is, is he has said that he's opposed to Israeli unilateral annexation. He hasn't gone a step further and said that any unilateral annexation provided by the Trump administration will be reversed by a Biden administration. So, but beyond that, the deepest thing that's really wrong with Biden is he has no, no new ideas for how to deal with the conflict, whereas we have a totally new approach. And I just had uh, yesterday an article that was published in Foreign Policy Magazine that said, the title is, uh, the Oslo process is dead, but the two-state solution isn't. And part of what I discussed in there uh, is what a Biden administration should do. And what I actually argue for uh, is for Biden to take the same stance that the British took in 1948, which is they announced that they thought that it was impossible to reach a solution to the conflict through further efforts at negotiation. And instead, they were turning the issue over to the United Nations. And I argue that's exactly what we should do, is turn it over to the United Nations. Biden should call for that. And the UN should create, as it did in, in, in 48, a special committee that would draft uh, a fully developed peace agreement that we argue it should be uh, uh, compatible with the Arab Peace Initiative. And then let, me, it let me just uh, try to interrupt position. there a little bit. Sure. I want to get to about 20 other topics in, in the few minutes we have remaining. So just I'm going to go through a list of topics or a list of issues. And you just, you know, it's this type of thing that Brian Rosens would support or not. So let's begin with the obvious, Medicare for all. Yeah, we, su we, we support it in the sense that if I was given a choice between, between that and the current system, uh, I, would, I would definitely support it. Um, I, well, think I want to make that, this as quick as possible, just to get more or less yes or no answers. How about Green New Deal? Yes. Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, probably revised in some way, but uh, broadly speaking, um, I see a purpose to it in, in relationship to China. What minimum wage would you... Uh, Definitely. You, what Definitely. minimum wage? I have to go back to Trans-Pacific Partnership for a second. I've studied this thing at great length. Yeah. It would basically transform this country into a corporate design order. And it's probably the reason why Donald Trump is less dangerous than Joe Biden. And very few people understand the very nature of this Trans-Pacific Partnership and all the details in 5,500 pages of so-called free trade, which is a Trojan horse for a, ma a massive, historically unprecedented corporate power grab. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other issues. How about... Uh, uh, disarmament, nuclear disarmament with uh, Russia? If it's yes or no, yes. And to what extent, if, if let's say China doesn't uh, join those negotiations, uh, how far do you yes. think we, we could reduce the uh, nuclear, nuclear stockpiles before we get into a, a, an unstable tripolar situation? Well, I can't answer it quantitatively, but I don't think it should be dependent on whether or not we can get China to, to join an agreement that it, it's not going to join. Okay, how about, uh, let me think of another, what, what do you think is the most, if, if it's something I haven't mentioned yet, what do you think is the most important issue of bread and roses that, that yeah, I- Yeah, well, about? yeah, so, and, and in some ways, you see, the point of bread and roses is basically to introduce things that aren't there. Um, and since I'm not gonna be president, you know, the, the question of what I would do, you know, on my first hundred days is, is really irrelevant. Bread and Roses has three, we have a very full program that, that's, that, that's on the website um, uh, with, you know, probably 50 policy ideas, but there are three central ones that, uh, that are new, that it's not just a question of our position on that, the things that we've developed. So one of them is what I, what I told you about Israeli-Palestinian, that is a specific plan that we call UNSCOP 2 for using the UN uh, to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The second one is something we call the, the Beauty New Deal, which would go uh, parallel the Green New Deal, uh, and it has to do with the roses perspective. So bread basically uh, is a material set of issues, and it's, it's basically, uh, you know, 
very large overlap with the Sanders campaign and the Warren campaign. And, you know, there are marginal differences on this, that, and the other thing. And it's not a question of more left or, or less left on that. But the big difference is roses. Uh, and we believe that beauty is a basic human need, and it's not at all part of our political discourse. And so uh, you can find this on, our, on, on the campaign website, which is um, uh, siegelforpresident.org. But we have a whole series of things there that, we, that we're now calling the Beauty New Deal. And then the third thing um, is probably even more central, uh, which is a new set of programs that we're calling You Be It. And it's in contrast to, to the UBI, and it's spelled U-B-E-I-T. Um, and that brings together new perspectives on, on work, uh, income, and time. And what it is, uh, it's a combination. It's a jobs guarantee, um, but it's a jobs guarantee, actually, that with 20 hours of work, uh, one would have a disposable income sufficient to meet core needs. And what we're trying to make possible, it's very similar to what I was talking about with respect to the politics of simplicity. What we're trying to make possible uh, is a new form of economic life, that one example of which would be that every person would have the opportunity guaranteed of 20 hours of work at a minimum wage of let's say $15 an hour um, within the job system, that is the basic employment system that we have in this, in, this, in this country where you have to go out and find someone to hire you uh, at some sort of job. And the disposable income that you would have from that because of a set of other policies would end up being sufficient to basically give you enough income to meet core needs. And then the remaining 20 hours, 10 hours of, that, uh, of, the, of, of the remaining 20, when you subtract the 20 from the 40, would be for what we call passion work, which would be people doing the kind of activity that they would do even if they didn't get paid for it. That is activity or work that's deeply their own. And it could be in the marketplace or it could not be in the marketplace, but it would be work that was, uh, that was very deeply one's own work. And then the remaining 10, 10 hours would be increased time for family and friends. So that's one, that's one particular pattern, 20, 10, and 10. So it's 20 hours of job work, 10 hours of passion work, and 10 hours of, of greater time for family and friends, with there being a guarantee of that job and a guarantee that the disposable income from it would be sufficient to meet core needs, what people sometimes call a living wage. But there's no such thing as a living wage because there's no number that's a living wage. It's a question of a certain annual income that you need that depends on family structure and a variety of other things. Well, that sounds great, Jerome. I, I, we're gonna have to leave it there. We're running out of time and I appreciate oh, okay. uh, what your uh, time with me this morning. Yeah. We'll get this up on our website and I'll yeah. let you know when it's coming. Yeah. Thanks let me just say one time. last thing. Go ahead. Is that, is that when we talk about what's the point of bread and roses, it's not really, uh, if people are interested in us, sort of what's our position on a hundred different issues as if we're doing some sort of you know, town meeting. What's interesting about Bread and Roses is the value added. It's, it's these three ideas as an example that we developed. It's not that we took positions on them. We developed policy proposals that came from a perspective that other people don't share, both about the conflict, about beauty as a human need, and about the need to transform everything about work, time, money, consumption, and so on through this policy that we call you be it. And that's what Bread and Roses is about. So that's the sense in which it's educational. Okay, very good. Well, I appreciate it. We'll have to leave Thanks. it there and, and I'll, yeah. I'll get this up. Thanks. Thanks for joining sure. us today. Take care. Bye-bye. Revolt Against Plutocracy won't just be covering the news about the necessary revolution in the United States. Sometimes we'll be making the news. If you want to stay on top of the revolutionary actions and strategies of grassroots, genuine progressives, and our allies, Please subscribe to our YouTube channel today.